Hi, and welcome to Mike Likes Robots, where we share knowledge to accelerate robotics. And today I want to talk to you about ROS2. Now this is something that I've talked about or used in quite a lot of my posts and my YouTube videos, but I've never taken the time to explain what it is or why you would want to learn it. So that's what this video is. It is an entry level video on what ROS2 is and why you might be interested in learning it for yourself. What is ROS2? ROS2 is a framework for robots that makes it easier and faster to get up and running. It's a framework that helps you divide your robot software up into different sections, or nodes, they're called in ROS2 terminology. Now the nodes can communicate with each other via messaging. What it means is that you can have a node responsible for each part of the robot, like reading a sensor or controlling how the robot moves. Doing that means that you get a more scalable setup for how your robot behaves. If you want to add another sensor, you can add another node in, and you don't need to change the core robot program. Now this is in contrast to writing one long program to control the entire robot, which is difficult to scale because it's difficult to add new parts of the robot, like sensors, or to change how it behaves in a modular way. Say you want the same behavior across two different types of robot, but they have slightly different wheelbases, you're going to need to create a new copy of the program and then change different parts of it. ROS2 and other robotic systems work to divide these responsibilities up. So where did ROS2 come from? The Open Source Robotics Foundation have built ROS2 based on ROS1. ROS1, or just ROS, stands for Robot Operating System, and it had a similar goal in mind when it was created, and it proved incredibly popular with roboticists. ROS2 was a whole rewrite of ROS. It took the excellent starting point from ROS1 and improved upon the parts that could do with improving. For a beginner, it's quite hard to see the difference because the interface and the structure is very similar. You use similar commands to run the programs, you use similar concepts to build them. But once you get to intermediate level or higher, you start to see just how different it is with a different messaging system, more secure messaging possible, and different middlewares and so on. It also makes it easier to run across different platforms and use different computers to run the robot software. So overall, this makes ROS2 very easy to recommend both for hobby projects and for full professional developments. And that's why I would recommend learning it, at least to learn the concepts of one of the most popular robotic softwares in the world. And now that we know what ROS2 is, the next step is to take a look at the three major concepts of ROS2 that are helpful in getting started with robotics. The first thing is message passing. How do these different nodes actually communicate with one another? The next thing is packages. How is that code actually split up so that you can build your code and reuse it across different robots? And the final thing is the tooling. What does ROS2 actually provide you that makes it more helpful to build robots than just writing everything for yourself from scratch? To help me in describing, I'm going to be using this, the CamJam EduKit 3. So take a look at the top or in the description if you'd like to build one of these for yourself. As it is, we can use this to describe what ROS2 can help us with. So first up, message passing. So let's take this robot and assume that instead of having one giant script to control the whole robot, we're using one node to control the ultrasound sensor, one node to control the line sensor, and one node to determine how the robot moves. The first thing that we want to do is make sure that the node that defines the behavior of the robot is able to access the sensor data, even though it's in a different node. And there are three main ways of passing messages within ROS2. The first thing is topics or publish subscribe model. That essentially means that a sensor like this one can repeatedly publish messages as long as it's able to read the sensor. It will just keep producing them and publishing them onto a topic. Now each topic has a message type associated with it. When you create the topic by publishing to it or subscribing to it for the first time, you can define that message type. ROS2 has lots of pre-built types available for this, the message types. One of them is the range type, and that's what we would use for the ultrasound sensor. That means that a node that is reading samples from the ultrasound sensor can continuously publish range measurements to the rest of the robot. Any node that wants to listen to those range measurements can subscribe to the topic. Again, 
A node that is subscribing needs to state what message type it's expecting from the topic. And if that conflicts with what the topic is already having on it, then the subscription fails. Similarly, if two nodes try and publish to the same topic, say slash distance, but one is publishing a range message and the other one is publishing another type of message, the second one will fail as well. So in that way, as long as they're publishing the same message type, you can have two or more nodes publishing to the same topic and two or more nodes subscribing to the same topic. You just have to have the matching message type. So in this case, we have one node publishing range messages, another node publishing line messages, or rather just a bool saying whether it can spot the line or not, and a third node, which is the behavior of the robot, that is subscribed to the range messages and the line messages. By doing that, we can pass messages between them. We can publish messages as fast as we're able to read the sensor, and we can take some action when a message is received. So the subscriber here says, I want to subscribe to this topic with this message type, and whenever I receive a message on that topic, I want to run this code. And by doing that, the robot could see all the range messages coming in, determine that an object is too close and stop the robot. By doing that, you can separate all your nodes into separate chunks of code that just publish and subscribe messages as they need to. You can also then reuse that code. So by having one node that publishes an ultrasound sensor, you could easily add another ultrasound sensor. All you need to do is run another node exactly the same, but give it different pins of how to connect to the ultrasound sensor. So the first message passing type is topics, publishing and subscribing on topics with message types. The second type is services. Services are a request response model, meaning that a node can offer a service and another node can request that service and receive a response in return. For example, let's say that this robot had an expensive sensor on it. You only want to read it when you need to, like you're taking a snapshot from a very expensive camera for determining what object to pick up if you're using a robot arm. What you might do is have a camera node that offers a service to take a snapshot. At that point, you can request an image from that camera node and it will respond with the resulting snapshot. Now, this is really useful for expensive sensors, like I said, or if the robot needs to wait for some response before it can continue on. Let's say that you have a robot arm that is closing a gripper. You want to make sure that the gripper is completely closed around the object before picking that object up and moving the arm again. So what you might do is request that the gripper is closed and then wait for the response that the gripper has closed fully before continuing on. So if our first message passing type is topics and our second message passing type is services, our third message passing type is actions. And actions are very similar to services. The main difference is that instead of just having a request and a response, there's now an intermediate message type, which is the feedback message. So with our expensive camera, we could say, please give a snapshot as a request and the camera can keep giving you feedback messages. Optionally, it may choose not to give you any messages, at which point it's equivalent to a service, or it could give you messages saying it's expecting a snapshot in three, two, one. So these feedback messages can help the robot that is making the request take some action while the action is being performed. Let's say that you have a robot that is trying to navigate. Maybe it would request that a particular waypoint is reached by the robot. And then while the robot is navigating to that waypoint, it produces feedback of all the points that it is passing through to get to that waypoint. Or it could publish the speeds it's moving at, for example. This would allow the robot calling the action to take some action of its own. Let's say taking a snapshot every meter so that it can keep a track of where it's moved. So between those three, you have topics for publishing and subscribing. You have services for request response, and you have actions for request feedback response. Those are the three main types. Moving on to the second major benefit of ROS2, which is the packages. Packages are a standard way of arranging code. 
for ROS2 to be able to build. Packages contain one or more nodes, along with some information about the package and instructions of how to build that package. Therefore, you could have a package written in Python that controls the behavior of the robot, and another package written in C++, with instructions of how to build that C++ into a binary executable, and contains nodes for reading the sensors. This is a way that you can use ROS2 written in different languages to interact with other nodes exactly as if they were written in the same language. Now, language support is only one benefit. Another benefit is that this is what enables code reuse. So given instructions on how to build a node, you can now distribute that package to someone else and they can use it. Let's say I want to give my ultrasound package to someone else so that they can use their ultrasound as well. But it's not just a benefit in you reusing your code, it also helps you reuse other people's code. This is where the major benefit comes in of packages. You can install or incorporate someone else's package into your workspace that gives you access to features instead of you writing them yourself. You could have a robot arm that already supplies the package on how to move the robot arm around. You could have a package that controls how to close and open a gripper. You can have incredibly complex packages like the one from Moveit, which provides functionality like path planning and simulating the robot's movements as it moves around. Or you could have a navigation package like Nav2, which is responsible for moving the robot around given a particular instruction. By enabling you to reuse your code and to reuse other people's code, you can rapidly accelerate building a robot from scratch. The third major benefit of ROS2 is the tooling that comes with it. Now there's a great many tools available, some out of the box, some that you can install separately, but having ROS2 in place allows you to use these tools. The first example is recording. By publishing messages or by using services and actions, you can record the messages that are passed between the nodes into what's called a ROS bag. That means a big bag of data with the times that that data was transmitted, and it allows you to recreate the messages that were passed around while the robot was running. So you could run this CamJam robot and record all the distance measurements and the line sensings that it got while it was running. And then on your computer, you can play it back and see what was recorded or even run the software again and see what action the robot takes. This lets you dig into why the robot is doing something, why its behavior has changed. The next example is logging. You can have nodes write log messages saying what they're doing, any problems that they run into. Then you can record these later and look at them after the robot has run, or you can view them live and filter by different log messages so that you can see exactly what's going on with your robot and whether something is going wrong. The third example that I have is in visualization. Arviz is a tool provided by ROS2, which is incredibly useful. It lets you visualize multiple different types of data. You could have range measurements visualized. You can display images captured from cameras. You can display the robot's appearance and the map that it is building around it if it's building a map up. You can even use it to interact with the robot, like setting a goal waypoint that you want it to move to. And so it gives you a rudimentary form of remote control. By using this, you can inspect parts of the robot as the robot is running or after the robot using ROS bags and see exactly what's going on with human ready visualizations. And finally, the fourth example I have for you is the TF library, which is the transformations library. It allows you to define how your robot is structured and then provides a way to transform points between different frames of reference. Let's say you have a robot arm with a gripper and a camera, and the camera is fixed and the gripper is able to move around. Now, if you capture an image of an object that you want to grip, you can get its coordinates in the frame of the camera, meaning it's a meter in front of the camera. How do you translate that into coordinates that the gripper can move to? Well, you need to understand how the camera is positioned in relation to the gripper, and that's what the transformation library can help with. By understanding that the robot structure has a gripper and then certain lengths of arm that lead back to the base and their current positions in space, and then how the base relates to the camera's position, you can transform all through those different segments until you get back to the gripper. So instead of writing the mathematics to change that coordinate system yourself, you define how the robot is structured, 
where the camera is in relation to the robot, and then request that the coordinates in the camera frame be translated to the gripper frame. So you can start to understand how useful this is in moving your robot around in more complex applications. Now let's take a more practical application. Let's say that we want to build a robot that can map its environment. Maybe it can explore one floor of a house at a time and build a map up of its surroundings. In this case, we'll build it based on the TurtleBot 4, which is a mobile robot around this size that has a whole list of sensors available to it, such as a 2D LiDAR, stereo camera, a normal camera, a floor tracker, wheel encoders, and the list goes on. There's a whole lot available with this robot, which makes it really difficult to code for. We need to be able to write code for all of those sensors, and we need to be able to write the behavior of the robot exploring and building up a map of its environment, while also keeping track of its own position within that environment. That's known as localization, and the process of mapping and localizing at the same time is called SLAM, which means simultaneous localization and mapping. It's essentially the process of a robot moving around, keeping track of its own position so that it can build a map up and put walls and obstacles and so on in place relative to the other obstacles it's already discovered. So we want to be able to build this robot. Now that seems like a complex application, but with ROS2 it becomes simple. And that is in part because the TurtleBot is an educational platform for ROS2. It comes with nodes for all the sensors and for the wheel encoders and so on already pre-built. So using these ROS2 nodes, you can get these installed and running as part of your robotics application. And now you have access to all of the sensors. But more than that, if you want to be able to navigate, then you can reuse an existing navigation package like Nav2. So now our robot becomes a collection of pre-built sensor nodes, including the ability to move the robot around in a particular way plus a third-party package called Nav2 that allows the robot to navigate to a waypoint. All we need to do now is write the logic to move to places that are incomplete on the map so that the map can be built up. That means that our robotics application becomes a full robot build from start to finish to just writing the logic for moving around within a map and making sure it's complete. This is one of the main reasons to use ROS. You can get going with a robot so much more quickly by using pre-built packages and by having a scalable framework to arrange your code and by having tooling to inspect what's going on in the robot. Even if you decide later to move to a different system or to translate parts of it to your own custom code, at least this gets you going with an actual robotics application that you can improve on your own. So there we have the main parts of ROS2 to understand before taking on your own tutorials. The message passing system being topics, services, and actions, the packages, which are the way that ROS2 structures its code to allow it to be reused and buildable, and the tools, or at least a selection of them, to give you an idea of what ROS2 can help you do. So that's my brief entry-level explanation of what ROS2 is and why you might want to learn it, as well as some of the core concepts inside it, knowing how nodes work and how they can pass messages to each other, what packages are, and what tools come with ROS are a great way to get up and running. So what's the next step? How do I get started with ROS2? There's good news here. Because ROS2 is such a popular robotic software, there's a lot of resources already available online, including tutorials from ROS2. You can go there and work through a whole series of tutorial from beginner through to expert, and all of them teach you new concepts about ROS2 and ways of making robots work. What's even better is that they generally use the TurtleBot simulator, meaning you don't even need a physical robot to learn how ROS2 works. You can do it all from your own computer. Although if you do want to become a robotics developer, I would recommend at some point getting some hardware. Maybe if you want to use a cheap robot kit, you can take a look at the CamJam EduKit 3, which is a very cost-effective kit to get up and running and moving something physical around. I have a whole series of videos on how to set up the CanJam EduKit and how to get ROS2 running on it, which isn't available in the worksheets. So take a look at the video, which will be at the top and in the description, and good luck in your ROS2 journey.